Hi, Tim Sue. First of all, I'd just like to say how wonderful it was to see so many of you last week. Kudos to Nancy and to Kevin uh, and any others who volunteered with making the car rally such a huge success that it was. And also, I just want to say how wonderful it was to see so many of you at the church service last Sunday night. And from what I hear, we'll be doing a few more of those over the course of the remainder of the summer. And then we'll be getting back together in the fall at the church. So today we are going to sing a song called Jesus Christ is Waiting. And it's, um, it's, it's, to be honest, it's a, well, a true confession here. It's to the tune that we know, Sing We Now of Christmas. So I found a nice piano arrangement of Sing We Now of Christmas, and I'm using it for, for this hymn. Don't tell anyone. And uh, so it's, but the neat thing about this hymn is it, it talks about us, our function as Christians is to represent Christ on earth, to be Christ on earth. And so um, what that sometimes involves is, is taking a stand. And sometimes it, it means expressing what the hymn says, rage or anger about injustices. And so as we, as we look at what's happening in the world, um, we need to, we need to take a stand against certain things that are wrong. And um, so I, w I want to express that. So things like um, people thinking that the, the children in the residential schools and, and the treatment that they received is just a bit of a hoax or that the COVID is a hoax and that the vaccine is some sort of totalitarian plot or, or something like that. Those sorts of things we need to, we need to, change people's minds on and we need to represent Christ on earth. Anyway, I don't know what Nancy's sermon topic is. I hope I haven't gone off on a, too much of a tangent, but join in the song. And when it comes to singing about rage, I, I want to hear some rage. All right, let's sing. Hi everyone and happy August. <laughs> wow, that's hard to believe. Time is flying by. Um, I want to thank uh, so many of you. It was so good to see so many of you come to the car rally scavenger hunt and then more who came to the service this last Sunday at six o'clock. 
We're hoping to have um, a couple more of those. So please watch for the announcements and bring a lawn chair and come out for our Sunday evening service outdoors. Um, we'll tell you those dates and we hope to see you there. It's so great to see each other as we head towards September and hopefully getting back together to worship together in our church. Also, thank you to so many of you who are contributing or have purchased at our auction. I know we're still looking for some items, um, so please step up and, and contribute something. Maybe it's something that you make or cook, or maybe it's a drive out on a Sunday afternoon with ice cream or um, making a meal for somebody. We would really like some contributions so that we can finish the summer and finish our auction on a positive note. Today's sermon centers around the verse that I'm sure everybody knows. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. It's found in Ephesians 4.26. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. 54 years ago, it was the summer of 67. It was the summer of love. Do you remember it? Kind of foggy <laughs> for some anyway. It was called the Summer of Love because that was the summer when high school and college students from across North America and perhaps around the world who were dubbed uh, hippies began to gather together in large centers for love-ins and other such gatherings. Starting to come back to you now? They gathered in Detroit and Los Angeles and Toronto and New York and Philadelphia and Montreal. But at the center of this summer, this Summer of Love, seemed to be San Francisco. In fact, there was a song written by Scott McKenzie, written by John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas, that suggested if you went to San Francisco that summer, you should wear a flower in your hair. Do you remember that song? Summer of Love. It seems to me that this summer might be dubbed the Summer of Anger. It seems to me that this summer, there's a lot of prevailing testiness there are so many people with so many issues to be angry about, the least of which is COVID with all its restrictions and regulations around this pandemic. Now, we all get angry, don't we? Of course we do. Perhaps you've already been angry today and it isn't even noon. <laughs> maybe you went to get that particular outfit out of the closet and it wasn't there, oh, it's still in the laundry. Or maybe the kids or your partner were moving too slowly this morning or you just can't stand wearing that breath restricting mask anymore. Well, what is anger? It's an emotion, of course. You can deny it. You can say, no, I'm not angry. Or you can delay it. You can say, well, I'm not gonna deal with it right now. I'll deal with it later. Or you can express it. You can just come out and say, look out, cause something's gonna give today. There are many ways to deal with our anger. Is anger wrong? Well, some people think so. And in fact, back in the Middle Ages, the monks listed anger as one of the seven deadly sins. But if anger is sinful, how could Jesus, who we believe was without sin, get angry? And he did get angry. He said to those Pharisees, don't you get it? You're letting tradition stand in the way of the word of God. Or how about those money changers in the temple? Remember when Jesus overturned the tables and he took the cord and used it as a whip? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild? I don't think so. Not in those moments, at least. Now, it seems to me that it's not that anger is wrong. We just have to, in the words of St. Paul, get angry, but don't sin. And how do we do that? We'll come to that in a moment. But first, let's talk about the types of anger. There are different types if you think about it. The best type, I think, is indignation. Indignation, sometimes it's a sin not to get angry. Angry about the suffering of millions of people dying of starvation around the world. Angry about the unmarked, unthinkable graves of so many children in the backyards yards of residential schools. Anger about residential schools. Anger at the prejudice and bigotry that is still prevalent in our country, in our province, in our communities. When God gets angry, it's a righteous anger. 
Does God ever get angry? Of course. God got angry before the flood. God got angry at Sodom and Gomorrah, angry at the people of Israel. Why? Because they had moved away from the one who made them, who freed them. A.W. Tozer said once that not only is it right that God gets angry, it would be hard to understand God otherwise. In other words, God's anger is part of God's holiness. When God is displeased, there is a reason for God's displeasure. So I think indignation is the best form of anger. And to me, one of the worst forms of anger is testiness or petulance. You know, people who say, oh, you cross me and I'll take your head off. You can see petulant people, or rather you can hear them coming a mile away. You hear them because they're so vocal and so testy. Oh, you shouldn't have done it that way. You should have done it this way, the way that I would have done it. Right? Petulant people are mean-spirited. They're sarcastic. And remember, sarcasm is the anger of cowards. Huffy crabby, angry people. And then there's the anger that comes from frustration. And I think that's the kind of anger that most of us are familiar with, especially these days. We're frustrated. We have this rage because of how we're being forced to live, to distance, to give up our usual freedoms. I think that we're often frustrated with something that didn't happen for us or because of something that happened to us, like we were diagnosed with cancer, or we lost our marriage, or we haven't been able to see our children or grandchildren, we can't travel, we can't even hug. And because of that, we're frustrated and angry, and we clench our fist and we shake it. Maybe at somebody else, and more often than not, we shake it at God. It's a spiritual frustration. We don't have the life we feel we are owed or that God should have blessed us with. We rant, even secretly in our hearts and minds at God. We're frustrated. You know, the word anger comes from the Middle English word that also means sadness. And sadness, I think, is sometimes at the root of our anger. We're grieving, we're sad and we get angry. Sometimes we're angry because we're resentful. Something happened to somebody else that didn't happen for us. Sometimes our anger comes from fear. We're afraid about tomorrow. So we get angry at today. We're afraid of becoming a target, so we lash out. Or we're afraid that we're gonna be a has-been before we ever get to be a somebody. Let's face it, there's a lot of anger around and we need to get to the resolution of anger because that's the most important thing. St. Paul said to the Ephesians, be angry, but don't sin and don't let the sun go down on your anger. So how are you and I going to deal with our anger? Let me suggest three ways. The first is to acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. I remember talking to someone once who had been betrayed by someone he considered a friend. And I said to him, you must be very angry. And he said, no, no, I'm not angry. And I thought to myself, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. A man by the name of John Dryden said, beware the fury of the patient man. <laughs> Sometimes if we don't acknowledge our anger, it comes out in our blood pressure or an eating disorder or a vindictiveness that sits just below the surface. So first, let's acknowledge our anger. Secondly, let's assess it. Let's assess our anger. And by assessing, I mean, think about whether we're angry with the right person. Or maybe our anger would be better directed to an institution rather than a person. Or are we simply frustrated in ourselves? Assess it. And the last thing is to express it. Now, there are some 
constructive ways to express anger and destructive ways to express anger. We all know that anytime there's an explosion, there's going to be collateral damage. And we can do a lot of damage with destructive expressions of anger. I remember a few years ago, I read a piece in the paper about a man in Calgary who committed what police called autocide. His car got stuck in a snowbank and he couldn't get out. So finally he got out of the car and he opened the trunk and he took out a tire iron and he smashed in all the windows of his car. Then he took a large hunting knife and he bludgeoned and slashed all four tires. He killed his car. He was angry. Auto side. <laughs> you can kill more than your car if you're angry. You can kill a job. You can kill a team. You can kill a friendship or a family or a relationship. And tantrums, those are best left to the kiddies. We all have our social tantrums, our monologues of self-pity, but nobody wants to hear those. So what about constructive ways to express our anger? They do exist. That is, for example, making our anger toward an institution become ways in which we can stop the machinery of injustice. There are lots of examples of this. Gandhi, Thoreau, Martin Luther King Jr., the list goes on. And lists of people still today who, as a result of their righteous indignation and their relationship with God, do what they know they need to do to make things better by stopping injustices as a constructive way to express their anger. They write a letter or several letters. They talk to people, they call their local MPs. They make a statement before town council. They do something constructive. What about talking to that person that you're angry with? Do you do that? Well, I have to waffle on this one, to be honest, because it all depends. I mean, sometimes it's good to get something off your chest, right? To feel liberated from your pent up anger by letting the person know that yes, you are angry with them. They might not even know that you're angry with them unless you tell them. But if you decide that you're going to tell somebody that you're angry with them, don't think that's the end of the story. Oh, well, here it is. I'm angry with you. Case closed. So there. That's just the beginning. Once you tell somebody you're the angry with them, the work begins. The work to right the wrong, to repair the relationship. You know, of course, there is a link between the Holy Communion that we celebrate at church and our anger. At the invitation to the table in the communion service, the words used are, all of you who profess Jesus as your Savior and Lord and, and are seeking to live in unity with one another are welcome at the table. Now the invitation comes from the admonition of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, where it says, if you're going to come and bring your gift to the altar, to come before God, and you realize that there is a discord, a problem between you and somebody else, you should leave right then and go and be reconciled to that person. And then you can come and bring your gift to God. In other words, Jesus is saying, keep short accounts. And maybe that's what Paul is saying too when he says, be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Probably the best thing that you and I could do as we go into this new week and this new month is to keep short accounts, to find constructive ways to express our anger, to let our anger become channels of truth and not bluster. Imagine, imagine the life in which at the end of the day, as we went to flip off the last light in the house, as we head to our beds, we had dealt with our anger, each of us. Boy, there would be real peace in the night and true joy in the morning. 
Let's pray. God of love, your righteous anger rebukes us and corrects us because you seek reconciliation. And so help us this week to make our anger channels of truth and agents of peace before the sun sets and the morning comes. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.